Okay, um, so yeah, thanks to the organizers for this really very exciting combination of expertise here, very unusual and very inspiring, I think. Um, and uh, so yeah, so my talk will um, go back to um, these ideas of um, information-driven curiosity somehow. And um, I think the underlying mo motivation for this work was I'm also a computational neuroscientist <coughs> similar to Jochen and I worked on, on sparse coding algorithms for many years and uh, somehow they are um, the short, I mean, the, the kind of the short term in explaining, for example, what V1 does comes uh, basically with this transition from simple to complex cells. So basically these sparse coding algorithms form simple cells, but already how actually this invariance is built in into the complex cell representation is not so well understood. And this actually made me to step a little bit back and um, think more broadly about uh, y y you know what really the sensor system in connection with the motor system is going to do and what learning means in really a closed uh, perception action loop and I think in Berkeley what inspired me really was also um, colleagues like Alison Gopnik who wrote this book The Scientist in, in the Grip and you can already see that this is very much about the um, idea of optimal experimental design um, you know in, uh, uh, for ex uh, understanding uh, what actually uh, uh, um, happens during uh, um, development in a child and um, another thing that really uh, inspired me I hope that the video works and it does not, this is very unfortunate. It does not work anyway. Th so this is a, this is a uh, so you see here a crawl uh, and the, the crawl kind of sli slits down on a, on a, yogur a yogurt lid um, and, and uses this roof as a, as a, as kind of a, um, you know, as a kind of having fun by sl slitting down on this yogurt lid. Then it picks up the lid as soon as it's uh, down here on the roof and um, um, brings it back, uh, flies back to the top of the roof and, and, and repeats this action. No food involved, no reproduction involved here. And this crow just figured out to have fun with this piece of trash basically. So um, the talk outline, I will briefly say something about the roots of these, of these theories of information driven exploration. Just because they were not mentioned so much, I will build very much on Manuel's uh, tutorial, but there is uh, um, this field of um, optimal experimental design, which is really roots kind of all these, these approaches that uh, Schmidt Huber and, and others have been using. And I just want to mention them because they go back way farther and are very interesting. Um, and then I basically will just go through um, basically the work that uh, we did and this was really in collaboration with my students. So um, the second part will be uh, um, exploration based on what we call predicted information gain, PIG. And uh, this was basically work by Daniel Little, his PhD work basically. He's now postdoc at University of Chicago. And uh, then um, the, the, the last part of the talk is uh, basically an extension of this uh, model to unbounded state spaces. And I will explain to you why this transition is very important for understanding the concepts of learning in closed sensor motor loops and is really critical. Um, and this was work done by uh, a student, Sharik Mobin, who is actually applying for the PhD program in Berkeley and other places right now, and, J and James Arneman. So, um, We have heard a lot about this uh, balance between exploration and exploitation. Um, I will not talk about this. I basically, I am interested here of what drives exploration in the absence of revolt. And, um, and basically the way how I think about it and how people think about it is um, in the terms of um, optimal experimental design. So the idea is really that um, somehow the uh, agent um, has a model of the, of the outside world, based on that model performs a, a, an experiment by doing an action, 
uh, samples the world by getting some sensory input and this uses this for model selection and parameter estimation and uses then the updated model to decide to 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 uh, basically um, create a new action and so in this loop kind of it gains understanding of uh, for example the outside world and um, why why are these ideas important so first um, they contrast um, basically to the standard ideas of learning in machine learning right now which is very much based like you know efficient coding based stuff without the reinforcement learning component which is kind of the idea is you have a pile of data and you basically the agent has access to all the data and <coughs> basically then adjust parameters and uh, deep learning these uh, kind of back propagation neural networks have become very successful if provided with tons of data but the question is, is this really the, the right model of how the brain learns? Or do we need another paradigm? Well, the action can be used to really actively select data to actually learn better with fewer data. And I think there is really something to this. And um, of course, if we would understand this, uh, th this loop in, in, in agents better, we, it would be the basis for building machines that can autonomously learn and I mean, uh, Pierre-Yves uh, here uh, has shown us beautiful examples yesterday and with the playground experiments, very, very um, interesting. And um, <coughs> a, a last thing I want to alert you that here's again a balance. And you will see this balance um, if you go to the, actually the unbounded state spaces. And the balance is not between exploitation and exploration here, because there is no reward. But of course, I, uh, I acknowledge that often this will be connected with reward, but I'm most puzzled about behavior where you have no obvious external reward that we see in, in nature. And so I'm focusing here on this. But the new balance that comes in here <coughs> is really the, the balance <coughs> of basically between modeling the predictable versus discovering the novel. So the agent can either spend time on exploring better what it already knows is out there and could be modeled better, or it can do actions that actually get him into entirely new states and uh, kind of widen its horizon. And this is a new balance that comes in, in with these models, and I just want to alert you to that from the beginning on. So now let me start with this little introduction, a little history, a, a few slides on the history. There will be some formulae, I will try to explain them in words. If you don't get into them, uh, it's, it's not a, a big deal. I mean, it's, it's, I know it's fast now in this half hour and it's the last talk before the break, so don't, don't uh, um, uh <coughs> get stressed by this. So. Um <coughs> The, um, the, the, the only early theoretical work on optimal experimental design really starts with a statistician who was actually uh, a postdoc with uh, Pearson in 1918. And uh, Christine Smith basically um, um, applied this optimal, this active learning paradigm to the guidance basically well to, to make new measurements in an interpolation problem of a curve. And, um, and so it's, it's uh, uh, basically, this, this work that she published here in 1918 is in, in many ways kind of the foundation of, of optimal experimental design. Um, <coughs> then, um, following Shannon, the first work that really brought in information theory in the optimal experimental design is actually work by D.V. Lindley, who, who was at UCL in uh, London, and um, who actually um, <coughs> made, the f to my knowledge, the first definition of information gain and really based on information gain and I will go, uh, briefly go through this. And uh, then uh, there was a, a guy actually in Germany, uh, Pfaffelhuber, who actually um, defined missing information also very closely related to information gain and applied this to actually learning synaptic weights in the early 70s. <coughs> and, and then last but not least, there was this work by uh, David McKay where he basically um, 
of in, in 92 wrote a paper about optimal experimental design that uses a form of Bayesian information gain, which was then later used by Schmidt-Huber in, in agents and so on. Um, <coughs> so basically Lindley started really from this purely Bayesian view. And so the idea is um, if you have an op observable quantity X, then you basically, uh, if you have a parameterized model x given theta and the prior on theta, you basically can 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 um, model p of x as this integral, and um, and then he basically defined um, the information gained by an individual observation is basically just um, here. The, um, the, the kuhlbeck leibler divergence between uh, the, uh, p of theta given x versus the prior. And uh, this will be on the next slide, I think, again, this is uh, this kuhlbeck leibler divergence here. So it's basically, <coughs> um, yeah, and, and then basically he de defined, the second thing is he defines then the <laughs> average information gain, where he takes the expectation of this i of x um, over all possible observations x. And if you write this down, it basically, uh, uh, then you get this, this other integral in front of it, dx, uh, d, uh, dx p of px, and here you have this, this other KL inside. And this can be then written as this fullback leibler divergence between the, uh, the, the joint uh, probability of x and the parameter theta and the, the marginals, basically. And that's the Shannon, the Shannon definition of, of mutual information, basically. But interestingly, it can also be written as the expectation of a KL that actually compares two distributions about the parameter theta. And it also can be rewritten as an expectation over all parameter values of a KL that actually measures the difference between two distributions over the observable quantity x. And I just want to keep you that in mind, so you can either measure two models by comparing basically the distribution of their, of their um, parameter, of their parameter distributions that um, usually have a certain distribution given, given your observations, or you can also express this as, um, a, a, as basically, so, so that's kind of um, so basically, in this in this view, where um, where we take the the kuhlbeck leibler divergence of two distributions in the parameters, this is what I will call the Bayesian information gain, and um, and then the other formulation here, if you have a kuhlbeck leibler divergence about distributions in the observables, this is another form of information gain. It's just important to kind of keep this separate. In David McKay's paper, he is now the first to um, really basically say, okay, let's now really uh, um, um, define the history of observations and the observations you can al already think here of, of sampling actions AI and SI is a sensory input following that, that action AI. And um, then you basically can say, okay, the, uh, uh, now I can basically uh, um, say, okay, that, that the distribution of my parameters in my model after a history of observations given by, uh, here by Hn is simply the conditional probability of theta given Hn. And then he basically defines um, the Bayesian information gain as um, the kuhlbeck leibler divergence between the old distribution o uh, over the parameters given the n in observations and the new one where you basically add one new observation to it. And this basically, if this is big, it basically means that your parameter distribution has changed in the light of this one observation a lot. And that, that means that this observation was very valuable for actually um, shaping your model. And um, this was then later also um, renamed as Bayesian Surprise, but basically this um, underlies some of Schmidhuber's work, the, the Stork et al. paper, for example. And um, this is basically um, has been used for describing curiosity drive in agents. Um, 
<coughs> the problem of this is um, if you if you use this quantity to um, you basically still um, what is nice is that it really gives you the full Bayesian view basically so you get always um, the result of n observations is this full distribution of your parameters which has a width which corresponds to the uncertainty of your model uh, of, of your of your s parameter settings and the mean which corresponds to the mean parameter um, but the not so nice thing is that, that to translate this into a model that really predicts the predictions of, of sensory inputs that translates in a tr distribution of P of S's for example this <coughs> requires integrating out this parameter distribution which is uh, in general very very heavy uh, in in computational uh, to, uh, requirements basically and um, so therefore what we did basically with, Dave, uh, with Daniel Little in um, in, the, in a paper which was published in Frontiers in 2013, there's an earlier archive, uh, archive version in 2011, is that we actually um, use this missing information notion of, um, actually introduced by Pfaffelhuber, uh, which is really now measuring the uh, KL between the observable quantities and not between the parameters in the model. And um, we basically um, can then also define the probability of a, a distribution of observations given n, ob, uh, n um, observations and the new the, if you add one new observation the probability distribution the estimated and I, I denote the estimates by hat here by n plus one and so basically the information gain is now simply how much your missing information is reduced by one by the one new observation um, how are you computing the KL with the um, marginal P of X? Because you don't know that, right? Or do you exactly. So that's a good point. So good observation is, so if, if I would naively say, okay, this is what I use for, for uh, action control, then you would tell me, nice, but you don't know P of X. Very good. So we have, this is the first thing we basically have to get around. And uh, just uh, for, for, um, for nomenclature, this is basically what, um, um, yeah, so, so basically, um, yeah, I will come to the predicted information gain later. So this is just if you have two observations, um, this is basically what we call information gain. And it depends now whether you take here the old versus the current um, measurements or if you actually project into the future us using your current model whether we call this predicted information gain or just information gain. So um, okay so uh, now basically the, the environment that we want to estimate it's very simple basically like in an MDP world so it's um, it's I mean it's basically a controllable Markov chain or in other words, it's an MTP minus the reward function because there is no external reward. There will be an internal reward, but the internal reward is different from, from an MTP formulation by the fact that the reward is actually dec decreasing with the knowledge of the agent. So it's not a constant reward function. Therefore, we don't need this reward function of the MTP. So I call this a controllable Markov chain. Basically, we have a set of actions. We have a, st a set of states. And um, we have basically, um, given the agent is in a certain state and executes a certain action, there will be a distribution um, P of S primes <coughs> given that condition. And this is basically what the, the agent has to estimate. Yeah, so that's, and, and I will also call this, this conditional probability, which describes the observations given a state action pair just by, um, by, by this matrix theta and the estimate is theta hat and here the three, uh, the, the three indices of this three-dimensional matrix are just the uh, um, state action pair where the agent currently is in and S prime is, 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 one, uh, is, one, is the state transition to S prime basically. Um, and um, we basically will test the agent in pretty simple constructed mo uh, uh, model worlds. 
Bear one is, is basically just, um, so you have this, uh, a number of states here, these black points, and you just draw basically transition probabi uh, pro probabilities from a Dirichlet distribution. The next uh, world will be one where you actually have a, a kind of a maze environment. So there's, there are these walls, the agent cannot pass the walls. Um, so if it actually would move in the direction of a wall, it would kind of be bounced back and stay in the same state. It has four actions. Um, there are also these blue, uh, these blue kind of trap doors, and if it would actually go right here into this trap door, it would end up in the one absorbing state, which is state 29. And the absorbing state environment is kind of, as you, as you will see in, in the experimental results, more challenging in the, in, in, in the sense that a random action um, almost always gets you to the state 29, so you cannot very evenly explore unless you use really a directed strategy, action strategy, which is different from random action. And then uh, a third, which we call the one, two, three worlds, is, is basically a world where um, the, the three actions are different in terms that uh, action one is always deterministic to just one follower state, action two is always 50-50 to do two randomly chosen follower states and action three is one third, one third, one third. And you will see in the experiments that we have reasons to, to actually test the agent in these different environments because <coughs> different strategies perform quite differently in these different environments. Um, so now basically for um, Training the agent, we have to solve one problem, uh, two problems. The first is basically the inference problem. So, given a set of data, what is kind of the best estimate, the current estimate of the of the of, of the world model? And the second, then, um, <coughs> given we have a current estimate of the world model theta hat, how should the the agent uh, basically choose actions to best improve its uh, the, 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 the 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 next estimate of theta? And uh, basically for the inference problem, we just use Bayesian inference. And so you basically can uh, set always the best theta hat um, with a given history is always this conditional expectation um, of theta. And what one can actually show that this, um, um, that, this, that, that this setting, which is just the Bayesian estimate, that this minimizes the um, it, it kind of minimizes the, the missing information. So it's the best choice you can do if the goal is really to minimize the missing information. And um, this just shows you um, a, an example. So this is an agent who was um, exploring this maze and um, in the by the gray level, and there are four actions on each state that it can perform. And on the gray level here, these wedges, they tell you um, how much missing information is actually left. So dark means a lot of missing information is left. And you can see that around the absorbing state, the agent explored very well, it's all white. But you have here, um, uh, you have here uh, kind of areas and state action pairs that are still pretty black. So this is a good, uh, this is kind of an example that if you just do random action in, in this maze environment, um, you do not explore very evenly the maze. And um, now I have basically to introduce you to two um, controls that we, that we use. Um, and um, basically one control is random action. So, and, and also these curves, you will see a lot of these curves. Um, the x-axis is always time. It's basically how many time ste uh, steps the, uh, the, the agent explored. And the second is basically the mis missing information. And so if, a, if a, the, 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 the steeper the curve drops, the better, the, the quicker the learning progress. This is how to ha you have to read these curves. Now we basically have two controls. The red is a negative control, which is just random action. So whenever um, the, the um, so, so, so random action is kind of always the the shallowest curve because it's kind of the worst. I mean, of course, there is our worst 
directed action policies, but I'm not interested in those. So random is kind of, if you don't do better with random, it's not worth it. And the other one is a, a positive control. This is something that the agent cannot achieve. Um, this is a control which is unembodied, where basically, so it, um, Manuel mentioned this um, switching cost. So if you go from the bandit to an embodied agent who is always, who can sample state transitions in such an environment, but is then bound in the next step to sample from wherever state it reached in the previous sampling process, you basically, the agent is, is con constrained and has to, to look into the future to do planning. So you, um, because no, unlike a bandit problem where in every step you, can, you have access to every level, you are really bound by your past moves, what you can sample now. And um, if you remove that, this is basically what this, this black control does. Then of course, then you can, you can uh, sample an environment much more easily because for example, uh, 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 an absorbing state cannot trap you. You can always reset yourself just to another state and, and do the sampling there. And so basically what we have here, the bandwidth that the real agent's performances can, uh, can be in is basically in, uh, between the positive control and the random action. And so you see in uh, just the Dirichlet world, they coincide and there's no, we don't have to worry about what action to take. Random action is already good enough, so forget it. And uh, the, um, but you see here in the mazes, there's a quite big uh, range where the agent can actually um, perform and also in this third world. And so um, now we come actually to this, um, uh, to this problem that, uh, that you brought up and this is um, the missing information um, contains this difference of two KL um, divergences and um, each one contains the ground truth world which the agent doesn't have access to. But what we can show is actually that the expectation of this difference is equal to a weighted sum of KLs which are between the current <coughs> internal model and a new anticipated internal model where basically one fictional observation is added. And so this is something that the agent can compute and this is actually what we do. Therefore, this is something that an agent can internally compute. And um, that this works well, I, sh I just I have to, to, to hurry up a little bit. So this just shows you that basically the predicted information gain and the realized information gain for all the three worlds are kind of um, the, um, are, um, are, are matching. And now I show you here basically the, um, the results. So the green line now is basically um, an agent that greedily applies this predicted information gain for um, action control. And you can see here, no surprises. It just falls on top of the, the, the black and the, the red line. Um, but here it's very disappointing. Here we are basically very close to random action, so we didn't gain very much. Here you can see um, that already uh, the greedy uh, predicted information gain gives you quite an advance in, in learning speed. And so this is the first take home message here, I that if the world is challenging, in particular in terms of having absorbing states, you need to uh, uh, to, uh, to to uh, adhere to an optimization of this objective function, which is non-greedy, but has a, a, a finite uh, a temporal horizon, which is longer than one. So you have to look into the future. And uh, Manuel explained this. We use basically value iteration to, to do this. And um, if you do it, and I think this is a time horizon of 20 steps or so, then you see you basically get from here to here. So basically this objective function is good, but only if you do a non-greedy optimization. And you can also see here that you get some, um, some additional improvement. Um, <coughs> and um, yeah, and so we compared th this to all kind of other reinforcement strategies that are applicable um, without um, a, an, an, an explicit reward function, uh, least taken action, counter-based and Q-learning 
on past change and you can see that the green line does pretty well. <coughs> we also then um, ask, well, if we, if we basically say, okay, this agent learns just by doing this information-based exploration an internal model of the world, how can this actually be used um, if you now do a reward task or a navigation task? And so basically in these graphs always this, this lower left um, quadrant is, 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 is kind of good performance. Then we also see that we basically with the controls our agent here lies kind of in, in, in the good range. So in other words, if you just do this undirected exploration just based on information, you do also very well in then a defined specific control, uh, uh, reward task, for example, or navigation task. And um, so this was basically for the finite uh, world. And what's of course unrealistic there is that the agent implicitly already knows, I mean in the maze environment there are 36 states and so on, but this is very unrealistic because usually the agent is just exploring the world and has no idea how many states are out there. And so therefore we basically with, um, uh, with uh, Sharik and James we extended this to um, um, unbounded state spaces and ba basically we also use um, kind of a non-parametric Bayesian statistic approach here. We use a, a, a Chinese restaurant process for describing basically the, 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 the transition probabilities um, in the world. Now basically the agent has, um, so CI is the count, how often a certain transition was observed. And um, if um, the transition was already observed and there's a number of counts, then this is the transition probability. But there is always this peep size, so this is a, a positive um, um, uh, transition po possibility, which is parameterized by theta um, and goes down actually with more and more observations, but only hy hyperbolic basically. This is the probability that uh, the agent visit a visits a state it has never visited before. So there's always this probability now that the state space expands in the agent. And we did kind of an empirical base version where we kind of adjust this theta to the data um, using maximum likelihood. So we basically use this formula for the theta. So this gives us then um, a, a version um, of, this, of this internal model where we don't have to worry with the initialization of the theta parameter. And um, here are the learning curves and so you can see that basically the, um, the old version, so this is now in a finite environment, in the blue curve is the old, the old agent that is given the already the information that the, the environment is finite and how big it is. But you can see here the purple curve is this uh, empirical base CLP uh, PIG version and this does also better than the competitor models and not quite as well uh, of course um, as the agent who actually is given the information of the size of the environment. How, how do you do the, est the estimation online? Online? The estimation of what? Well, the estimate. The, so you're still estimating these uh, Dirichlet probabilities, right? The, the uh, Dirichlet posteriors, but now you have this. You now you now you have to do inference over the partition, which you can't do online, right? Unless you make some approximation. Um, well, we can we can basically we we still use the counts here to estimate the transition probabilities. Very similar of what, it, and this is actually the base and inference. This is the best mean model is basically to use, to use this. And so we can still do this. So it's, this is computationally not, not more expensive than actually doing the, the other agent. We, we can go into the details later. But okay, so um, if you now have an unbounded environment, now basically purple is again the, the new model which can handle this and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the, the um, uh, so, so now the, the, the purple model is the, the empirical base and the, the green model is actually one where we optimize the theta. It's a fixed theta but we optimized it for actually um, declining here fast and you can see that this empirical base actually declines about the same a little bit faster so definitely this empirical base is, is, a, is kind of the best 
<coughs> the best model that we, we found so far. And this uh, here so uh, shows you basically now an environment where um, two agents explore. One uses the empirical base PIG and the other one uses an uh, least taken action approach, which you can also run in such an environment. And you can see that somehow the empirical base here explores more widely. So in this balance between uh, exploring the known versus d discovering the unknown, the, um, the, um, the empirical base is a little bit um, more on the, on the discovery side. But again, this also depends on how you compute the differences between the two different models. So this is, it's model dependent, and I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than the other. Um, but um, so what we basically, to summarize what we learned from this is um, that um, learning and action perception loops is basically the old optimal design problem, no surprise. Uh, state space information uh, 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 gain is basically what we use here. It's convenient, but it's not quite a pure Bayesian thing, which would be really the Bayesian information gain that uses the distributions of parameters in the model rather than distributions of prediction distributions. Um, <coughs> the um, so basically maximizing this PIG minimizes the mis missing information. Um, it's very important to optimize, if you have such an objective function, to optimize it in a non-greedy fashion if the environment is interesting. Um, and the extension of the uh, PIG into this unbounded environment, um, uh, what we see is basically that the CLP plus empirical base works pretty well, has no free parameters, uh, basically uh, self-adjusts the parameters to the data. Um, it's also important that in this unbounded setting, surprise-based information seeking does not eliminate surprise. We discussed this yesterday. Um, uh, with, uh, when Gert was basically saying that, you know, in, in, in bounded environments, definitely it does eliminate surprise, but not in unbounded uh, environments. There you basically have this balance between elim elim eliminating uncertainty and discovering more states. And, um, where you strike this balance depends on models and it's also not clear. I mean, I don't have really a normative answer to what's the best balance here. So thank you. Um, so I'm curious, you had one slide where you did apply these methods to um, ask that do have rewards. Right. But they work fine. But I was wondering if you, depending on, um, like if you have a maze where there's some parts of the maze where you figure out that if you go beyond this barrier, you're going to get stuck and there's no point in really knowing all the, all the specific state action transitions, especially if you know the reward is somewhere else. And so if you want to figure out how to get to a reward, you might want to weight your predicted information gain, like the degree to which you know about the world's in relevance to uh, performing a particular task. So you don't want to necessarily learn it equally about all possible states. Right. Is there a natural way to do that? Yes, I mean you can, so this is basically, this is one term in an objective function uh, for, for action selection and you could add, add other terms. And so I mean what we added for example there is also this notion, and this came not up very much here, so this is kind of an internal model based action guidance where really the, uh, it's like learning progress also, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's basically the, 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 the agent tries to, to improve its internal model. There's another idea, and this is just to maximize mutual information between current and future sensory inputs. This is called, to make it more confusing, pre predictable information, and it was actually um, uh, proposed by Nihat Ai and, uh, and Ralph Dare and so on. And this is, a, you don't need an internal model for that. You can just estimate this, this mutual information. And um, you can optimize this predictive information well and, uh, if you have a good internal model, but it does not really help you to find one. 
And it's now what we did is we kind of put, put such a predictive information um, um, ob, um, term into the objective and then just our term goes down if the internal model becomes good. And, but then also the, the, the action drive becomes boring because then it's kind of noise driven. But then this predictive information becomes more important. And so equally you could also put in a, a reward if you know what to put in, you could put in a, a reward drive to combine these two things. But then, of course, you would have the exploration, exploitation, balance again, and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I think this is vastly unfair because this is a very hard problem. But I, 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 I can't resist sort of pointing out the gap between the framing and, and here because I think this is a really um, interesting model for the kind of uh, exploration and experimentation that works when what you need to gain information is basically go to the state and sample from it, right? Um, and knowing what states to sample from is a very, very important and hard problem in its own right. But if you think about what it takes to do an experiment, uh, the, the entire point is you can't just go to a state and sample from it. You have to actually figure out an intervention or a manipulation that is going to change the distribution in some kind of way that's going to meaningfully distinguish between hypotheses. So it's not enough just to show up and sample information. You have to do something to actually create a change. That's what experiments are. And so in some sense, the point of, uh, of exploration and uh, information seeking, I, mean, I think it's a very worthy goal and certainly different from deep learning and, and, and important. But there's still, I think, a long way from knowing where you would like to sample information in a maze, say, and walking around and, and getting to the right space in the maze and saying, OK, well, here are some hypotheses and tension. Nothing I can currently sample from distinguishes them. What experiments do I do that would generate an observation that would tell them apart? Well, uh, you know, I mean, this is, it's, this is just about the problem. The agent doesn't know what an action means in terms of its state transition. And it's basically, this is, this is a model to find this out quickly. And uh, this is pretty general, but yes, there, there are, of course, li st extremely strong limitations in this model. It's all discrete state space, right? That's one. Um, and uh, so there are definitely limitations, and it's also true, of course, it's your, your action selection is based on your current models. I mean, with the unbounded model, we have shown how you can extend at least the internal model so that it, it is open to find new things, which is important, and also points out this, this balance that is not a problem in, the, in a bounded, if, if you just have a bounded model. Um, but so I think, uh, yeah, it is in an early stage, I have not made any connections to how this maps on neurons. So you would have to think about how can you store these, these transition probabilities in neural activity patterns, for example. I have not told you where this happens in the brain. Uh, it's also true that if it, you're an experimenter and you design your new experiments, there's a lot of, of constraints, what actions you might want, what new techniques you m might want to, ex to exploit for your next experiment, which is not described by this. But I think it, it points out certain basic uh, properties of, of information seeking. And in that regard, I find it's, it's still informative. Yeah. Maybe a bit on the side, do we have uh, evidence of our animals deal with this maze problem, if you put a mouse in a, in a maze, how do we... Yeah, so there is actually, there is one interesting work, and it's uh, by Ehud Ahisar's lab, and it's Goran Gordon, he was a, a, a PhD student of him, and so he ap applied a similar model to actually the exploration behavior of rats. But one, there's one big difference, so his model is a hierarchy of loops. It's if you have just this one thing, it's it, it this one. This basically closes the loop, but it's just one one loop. But uh, you have certain kind of interacting behaviors in 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 exploring rats. They they often follow walls, but then they sometimes do something different. And so it's very important to sometimes interrupt the loop and go one level higher and close close the loop. And his work is, to my knowledge, the first that starts to address this thing. Other, um, of course. Uh, things that we have explored is, for example, really um, eye movements. But I mean, in, uh, then you really need a model that, that models the diff different resolutions with eccentricity of the eye. So, so and then can really describe the information gain that you get if you now start to fixate somewhere in the periphery, where previously you had only a coarse account. And um, so that's uh, a 
positive. So there are, are applications of this. And, uh, and, and another thing is actually this, this, um, this information gain, not the predicted version, was also uh, used, uh, used to actually explain this, this vase and card sorting task in psychology. So that's more hypothesis testing task uh, with cards where, you know, on one side is, for example, um, the, the backs is, are green and red and you have, uh, for example, numbers and letters on it and then someone tells you, uh, you know, a hypothesis, for example, or the, 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 green, uh, the red back, backs have, have numbers. How do you disprove that? And uh, you can drive, uh, you can describe basically the, the sampling actions by, by something like this. So there are some, some applications of this, but I agree, of, of course, it's very simplistic still. Okay, so I propose that we continue the question during mm -hmm. the break. And uh, thank you again.